Hello, my beautiful students, and also the rest of you. Boy, do I have a story for you today. I'm excited to tell it to you, and there's lots of intrigue and corruption and blood and vengeance, and it's uh, got a happy ending, at least for now. Not to spoil too much, we'll get to that. We're winding up to the 11th century BC, which means it's that year that starts with one zero and then has a couple numbers after it. The 11th century BC, and we are returning to China. These are the years between 1073 and 1040, so it's a fairly short amount of time, but some significant events take place in China this time that I actually felt it was worth spending a whole lecture on this particular period of time. What we're going to discuss today is going on at the same time as what we've been discussing as going on in the Greek Peninsula, in Mesopotamia with Nebuchadnezzar and Tiglath-Pileser, Asia Minor, and in Egypt also. While those nations are busy rising and falling, China too continues to exist. So let's go check in on them and see what's going on in the 11th century. If you'll remember, when we left China last time we had discussed the Shang dynasties, specifically the Shang dynasty during the Bronze Age, so early 11th through 13th centuries, and we had discussed the silent Shang king Wu Ting. Well, the Shang dynasty went on for several years after Wu Ting and had several more rulers, and it went on in relative peace. As a reminder, geographically, the center of the Shang Empire is the Yellow River, as seen on your map, and the capital city is still Yin. Notice that south of the river and a little bit to the west is a region called Zhu, and we will be introducing the Zhu to you today. By the time the Hittite Empire has fallen, and Assyria and Babylon are going through their whole mess up and down, having their resurgence and then kind of fading away again, a crisis ends up coming to China. Similarly to the Mesopotamian and Egyptian and Greek kings, the, the Shang kings and their people were dealing with invasions. Unlike in those regions, however, the invasion of the Shang king was not at the hands of foreign tribes. Rather, it was by their own kinsmen, by people who were, at least in part, under the very empire. It's a bit of a nebulous relationship, but I'll do my best to explain it as we go forward. And this invasion is very different from the ones we've seen so far, because it's not motivated by a desire for power or new homeland, but rather it's motivated by a desire to overthrow a cruel and unwise ruler. As I mentioned before, west of the Shang lands and south, there was a tribe called the Zhu who lived across the Wei River Valley. In theory, the Zhu were in submission to the Shang King. The Zhu leader at least honored the Shang King with his mouth, but in reality, their land was hundreds of miles from the Shang capital and they lived a fairly independent life. So their relationship to the Shang kings and the Shang people is a little unclear. They have some subservience to him. They pay him tribute of a sort, but they are not considered as officially under the rule of the Shang king. The Zhu people were more loyal to their own leader than they were to the Shang king. So that's the relationship dynamic as best as I can describe it for now. Well, well, eventually the Zhu are going to invade the Shang. I'm going to tell you what happened to lead up to that event. Remember when we talked about the early Shang dynasty kings and especially Wu Ting, how they were noted for their wisdom? Well, it seems that later Shang kings started to decline. They were not nearly as wise. They abandoned their wisdom. This is a problem because wisdom is the foundation of power for the ancient Shang kings. We've noticed this all the way back to the beginning of any sort of monarchy in the Chinese culture is that it's really founded on the individual's wisdom and honorability. And you can see that in the three sage kings, as you will remember. And there were, of course, corrupt leaders, but they have always highly valued wisdom and honor in their kings, which is actually quite different from the Mesopotamian and Egyptian, even the Greek peninsula and kings, because those kings achieved honor more through military might and strength than through any nobleness of character. So China stands in contrast to these. So when a Chinese king or the Shang king specifically abandoned their wisdom, they also are giving up their power. They undermine their own right as a ruler. 
The Shang kings were really not remarkable for any military might or strength. They were remarkable for their wisdom and their nobility. So when the Shang kings abandon those things, they become unremarkable. Here are some examples of how far these kings have abandoned their wisdom, and some of this is quite disturbing, so hold on. The first emperor is called Wu Yi, and his offenses were primarily against the gods, against the divine forces. Remember, the Chinese have both deities that they worship as well as their ancestors who they pay honor to. So when I say divine, I'm referring to both of those together. Firstly, the supreme deity of the ancient Chinese was called the God of Heaven. Wu Yi made an image of the God of Heaven and called on one of the priests from the temple of the God of Heaven and had him represent the image that he had created. Then he sat down to play a board game with the God of Heaven the image that he had created. I believe that the priest represented the god on this board game. Well, Wu Yi, the king, won against the god three times. And when that happened, the king mocked the god for losing the board game. Secondly, Wu Yi had a bag filled with blood hoisted up in the air, and then he proceeded to shoot it with arrows. No initial problem, a bit strange, but it was symbolic and offensive because he said he was he was shooting heaven, indicating that he was shooting arrows at the divine beings and causing them to bleed, presumably. And the third thing he did was to say that the god of thunder and lightning was nothing, therefore blaspheming him. So those are the three offenses against the gods of Wu Ting that we know of. Why was this such a big deal? I mean, it's obviously offensive. Why was it so problematic? Well, the responsibility of the Shang emperors was to represent the divine beings to the people. Remember how we talked about the oracle on the bone ritual? Last time we talked about the Shang dynasty. This is an important thing to remember because we're going to bring it up again. The priests or the oracle readers would have a bone and when someone would come to them asking for a message from the gods, they would crack the bone with a hot point and then they would interpret the crack for the message from the ancestors or from the divine beings. Well, those messages, the transmission of those messages were done in the name of the king. The king was supposed to be the conduit of the messages from divine powers. So for the king to mock the very divine powers that he's supposed to represent to the people, whether they're ancestors or gods, was appalling. But the gods took care of it because, ironically, Wu Yi died by being struck by lightning while out hunting. Remember how he had mocked and said that the lightning god was nothing? Well, that's an interesting twist of events. The next emperor who was foolish was named Chu. Chu started out actually quite promising. He was strong, intelligent, articulate, that means he could speak well, and perceptive. He could sense and observe his surroundings and other people well. Unfortunately, he didn't use these things for good. He was able to use his intelligence and his ability to speak to resist any form of correction that he was given by his advisors. He could talk his way out of anything he'd done wrong, and he ultimately gave way to self-indulgence, to wine and to women and to just pleasure. He liked hunting, and he had a few other bizarre things he enjoyed doing. The love of pleasure that he had made him raise taxes so that he could fund his hunting forests and pleasure parks and fill them with animals to hunt. And his weakness for women made him become the tool of a woman criticism named Tachi, who was the only one he would listen to. As you will see in history, people who have too much authority and use it to support their own pleasure often give way to cruelty. Pleasure becomes not enough for them and they have to resort to more extreme, often very cruel measures to feel satisfied. And such was the case with Chu. This is going to get a little bit graphic, so I'll keep it short and as summary as possible. For instance, whenever Chu suspected a nobleman, one of the men who ruled under him and had their own individual authority, of being disloyal to him, he would force the nobleman to lie on a red-hot rack, which is a terrible form of torture. He had one court official flayed and another carved into meat strips and hung to dry. These are all problematic activities. 
little context to the next thing that he did. Evidently, there was a saying that the heart of a wise man had seven chambers. Well, Chu's uncle rebuked Chu. When this happened, Chu remarked that since the heart of a wise man had seven chambers, he would need to examine his uncle's heart with his own eyes to see if it had seven chambers and therefore to know if he should heed his advice. And then he did. And remember, this was before they had any form of screening ability to look into a person's heart without cutting them open. Chu was infamous. Chu was infamous. His cruelty worsened. Ancient Chinese chroniclers record that it knew no end. The families of the noblemen were filled with resentment and hatred for him. Finally, as if what he had already done wasn't enough, he overstepped his boundaries. Well, you remember the zoo who we introduced at the beginning of this lecture. They're coming in now. The zoo chief at this time, his name was Wen, and he had a title called the Lord of the West. So I'll refer to him by both his name and by his title. So his name is Wen, he is the chief of the zoo people, and he is the Lord of the West. And remember, the chief of the zoo people is not, strictly speaking, under the Shang King, but they do pay honor to him. So there is a sense in which the Shang King is his superior, but he is also largely independent from the Shang King. It's a strange relationship. Well, Wen had to go to the capital city in on business. And when he arrived there, Chu, the emperor, sent spies to follow Wen around the city and see what he would do. Well, the spies reported back to Chu that Wen, the Lord of the West, had secretly expressed disapproval at the actions of Chu. Actually, what they said is that he had sighed in secret over the king's behavior. And for that, the spies reported on him to Chu. As a result of this sighing in secret, Chu had Wen, the zoo chief, and the Lord of the West arrested and put in jail. 